So welcome to our listeners uh, for moving into the Unknown Feldenkrais podcast, episode number 19. I'm Kim McGregor, and together with Libby Murray, we're delighted to be speaking today to Dr. Susan Hillier, uh, who is a, a neuroscience expert. Um, Susan's actually been practicing as a Feldenkrais practitioner, I think for over three decades, actually, since 91. Uh, she's a Feldenkrais uh, trainer and also educational director. Susan's a, a professor in neuroscience and rehabilitation at the University of South Australia, where she teaches and also conducts research, predominantly investigating ways to support people in regaining function following a stroke and other movement disorders. Of particular interest to Susan is the Feldenkrais method in relation to training sensation, perception and awareness and the role of body image. Welcome, Susan. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Libby. And of course, hi to Libby, um, my co-interviewer this morning. Oh, hello, um, Kim, and hello, Susan. <laughs> so, uh, Susan, uh, you've had quite a journey, so uh, three decades or so, possibly even longer, uh, with Feldenkrais, um, finishing your training and um, uh, becoming a trainer and combining this with your academic work. Can you tell us, please, how you discovered Feldenkrais and uh, how your journey's unfolded up to now? Sure. Um, so um, it did start a bit earlier than, uh, than the training, obviously. So I graduated um, as a physiotherapist in um, 1984. Um, and had a job in a big public hospital here in, in Adelaide um, doing the usual sort of rotations. And I was it's fair to say that I wasn't um, particularly engaged in some aspects of my <laughs> first year of work. But I had this really supportive um, boss. You know, she was head of the, a, a very big department, uh, you know, with 10 of us new graduates. And um, she observed some of my... Um, struggles and uh, actually offered to for me to go and do some continuing education and that was to attend um, a, one, the phases so at that point um, in, it was in the sort of mid 80s early 80s um, Frank Wildman was bringing the method to Australia and he was touring around the country doing these things called phase what he called phases um, they were four-day Feldenkrais workshops, really intense, um, you know, ATM style workshops. So this was pretty unheard of for a new grad to be paid uh, to go and do something. Uh, and my, my recollection is that she said something like, I've read about this stuff. I think it's weird. I think you'll like it. Um, so there was a bit of a connection of, you know, weird and you and me. Yeah. Um, anyway, she, um, she, she did that. And I went to the first phase and, uh, that was kind of it. I was hooked. Um, and, uh, you know, this, there were several experiences, um, I guess you could say, that hooked me. Because um, obviously I'd gone in cold. I had no idea. All I knew was that it was weird, which was good enough for me. And um, and there, there, were big, there, were, there were big attendances at these phases. So it was a very full, very big hall as far as I can remember. And... Um, and, and those of you who've met Frank, you know, he's very charming and charismatic and, and he's, you know, he's a good Feldenkrais teacher if, of ATM in particular, a good speaker. Um, so that impressed me. I like the sort of his intellectual approach. But that's all kind of powered into, into, significant, into insignificance. <laughs> um, because what really sold me was the experience of it. And, and, you know, I was lying on the floor just wriggling around like everybody else thinking, oh, this is very nice. Now, I've, you know, most of my life I've been very hypermobile, so it's not that the the ATMs in themselves weren't enormously challenging, but I did feel I did feel changes on the floor, um, and I liked that the the process of inquiry, and um, so that was all fine. But I think what was the real clincher was um, that at the end of the day, and I lived in the country, well, forty kilometres away, and I had a car, obviously, that I was driving to and from, and I remember getting into the car and reversing the car out, you know, so having to do the big spinning wheels. And this is, remember, this is before power steering or anything like that. And it was it was a car that had big tyres. It was actually quite a groovy car. And, um, and... Uh, it, what sort of car was it? 
Tirana. Oh, Tirana. Which means nothing to an international audience, but they don't make the nails holden. Uh, and it was a six cylinder, so it's pretty damn cool, just FYI. And, um, you, you know, when in the past, you know, if you, if you, you, you had a, a car without power steering and you'd go and get the tyres pumped up and all of a sudden you'd feel, oh, my gosh, the car's so easy to steer because you've got better air in the tyres. That's what it felt like. It felt like something had changed in the car. So I immediately thought that, oh, this car is so easy to, to steer now. What has happened while I've been, um, you know, lying around on the floor all day? You know, nobody's come in and pumped the tyres up. Um, and then I realised it was me that had changed. So I'd immediately thought that because something in the environment was easier, that the environment had changed, but actually it was me that had changed. And, you know, we'd been doing probably, I don't know, you know, the shoulder girdly sort of things. I, I have no, I can't remember what the ATMs were. All I knew was that that this car reversed and backed and I could steer it effortlessly. So for me, that was, that's, and I didn't know how that had happened. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware of what the process was to get that kind of outcome, other than that I'd been engaged in some kind of process during the day and I felt fantastic. So I guess that's, in, you know, in a way that's a classic story, isn't it, about how people come to the method. For some, it's, you know, the ideas are really intriguing. Um, and for me, the clincher was, I got an unexpected experience and a personal experience um, that I couldn't account for. So I was really intrigued. Um, yeah, so that's that's the first thing. And then, of course, he came back and did another phase. I did another phase. Um, then I did like everybody else, finished, I finished a year of work and went and worked overseas and travelled a lot. And then when I came back, um, they were starting the trainings. And so the first training in Sydney had just started when I got back from overseas and the one in Melbourne was about to start. So I leapt onto that and um, joined in, um, which was, you know, kind of a tough time to be doing it because it's not like I had a lot of um, work or, you know, stability or, but it, it just was the right thing to do. I guess the other thing that helped me decide to do the training program itself was that I'd also had a really big car accident around that time before I went off traveling. And, um, and I knew the area that I wanted to work in, I wanted to work with people with disability. So I knew that I had to be physically very able. And um, to be honest, I did the training more as, as an insurance policy for myself. Not necessarily, I don't think I really thought through how I would use it in my work with other people more that I needed to do it for myself to work with other people so that was that was my original motivation and then of course you know what happens you do the training and then you realize you, it's, it's really hard to work any other way because it's Absolutely. so it just kind of becomes so organic in the way that you think that you can't see things in different you know you see things in this way so therefore your actions are in this way of you know this sort of approach so that's that's kind of it. So I still, you know, did go back into physio, but very specifically into um, neurological work, rehabilitation. So not particularly the manual therapy, you know, back pain kind of physio that people mostly think about. That's that, that's my that's my journey into the method. Yeah. So that you know that's a fabulous journey, and there's some some very personal experiences, obviously, that you've had there. I certainly love that power steering story. Yeah. But can you, do you have any particular standout moments of work that you've done as a Feldenkrais practitioner where it's helped uh, a, a client that you could share with us today? You've probably got many. Oh, heaps. Yeah, heaps. And, and in a way, sometimes you never really know. And that's, I think that's why I really, I really love the method because, Let's just say in the past, let's just say <laughs> I might have had a few control freaky perfectionist kind of tendencies. Um, and for me, that's probably one of the biggest changes in my self is that over the years that has dissolved. Um, and I really attribute that to the method because you can't control. control. I mean, you, you, you obviously are, you know, a practitioner in a lesson you know, you kind of know the lesson, you know, might have a plan, but you can never control precisely what's going to happen. It's not that linear cause and effect. I do this, the person feels that, blah, blah, blah. 
So to break that sort of nexus um, for someone with my kind of, you know, the personality that I had at the time is quite profound. And it's like only decades later that you look back and you realise, oh, yeah, I was like that. And um, so so that's the first thing I want to say. <laughs> so therefore, when you approach a lesson, to let that go and, and, and manage your expectations about what the lesson's going to do, that's the first thing for me. And that's, that's a personal change in me. So therefore, it's always delightful to hear from other people what the effect of the lesson has been. I mean, and sometimes it's nothing. And that's really good for your ego. And you've got to tell yourself, well, maybe something did change, maybe something didn't. Maybe they, they simply can't sense it yet. Um, because what we're doing, you know, requires an awareness that people might not have. Um, and other times it's, you, you, you know, I think the, probably the, the thing that gives me the greatest joy is when people go off and discover for themselves and I'm kind of redundant to the system. You know, and maybe that's because I'm inherently lazy as well. And I don't want the responsibility of somebody else's improvement. I don't want to be responsible for their improvement. I want them to be responsible for their improvement. So as a general comment, my greatest joy is when somebody comes back and says what's what they've done in the in the between lessons, some journey, some discovery, some light bulb moment that they could they don't attribute to me or it's nice when they attribute it to the method, but ultimately that something that, that's happened in their system that they feel they have the agency of. Um, and, yeah. you know, numerous examples, um, you, you know, about, and often it's more about, you know, and it'll be, well, maybe simple things like, uh, you know, a client recently, oh, I realised, you know, when I was walking, if I'd you know, and it might be something really banal, like if I let go of my belly when I was walking, I can actually breathe and walk at the same time, you know, that kind of stuff. But that's huge, you know, to, to take something that we've been exploring in a lesson and then they've actually put it into practice, so to speak, and noticed a change in their functioning, those kinds of things. Um, or, you know, things like, or a recent, a recent client um, who's really worried about her posture, and um, and after a lesson, she stood up and I just said something really simple, like, do you notice that it's quieter when you, you know, now that you're standing? And she burst into tears and it's like, oh, my gosh. Um, well, I'm, no, I'm kind of used to <laughs> we all get we get used to very different responses. And she said, that's what I've been craving. It just feels so noisy when I'm standing up. It just so that. And where did that language come from for me? I don't know. Um, but it just completely matched her experience that, um, you know, it's an unusual way of describing it, isn't it? That when you stand up, it feels quieter. Um, but her experience had been that standing for her was really noisy. So that kind of mixed sense stuff, you know, they're sort of trivial examples. Um, so in a way, you, you, you're almost, you know, you've given three examples there. You've talked about it, her nervous system. I imagine that quieting, quietening was a quietening of her nervous system. Mm. You've also talked about physical changes, but you talked about, you know, being able to let go of some of our tendencies, which I guess in a way is neuroplasticity, um, mm. which I, I know is an area that you're, you're very passionate about. Mm. Um, could you talk a bit about, you know, the way that Feldenkrais can work with neuroplasticity yeah absolutely um sometimes now I almost kind of blush to think that why didn't we realize <laughs> about neuroplasticity you know when I when I trained as a physio in um when we did you know neurology um we still learned the old hierarchical yeah um sort of nervous system structure that you know the evolutionary kind of spinal cord you know midbrain blah blah neocortex dominating rah 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 and that it was all pretty fixed you know pretty hardwired unchangeable you know reflex oriented blah 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 all that stuff that was we were still being taught in the early 80s but of course you read Fulton Christ's books and he's already talking about you know I'm after flexible um, flexible bodies yeah kind of interesting flexible minds flexible brains that's what I'm really after so that's really his nod that of course actually 
if we can change our behaviour and change our thinking and change our actions, um, something must be changing in our brain because, you know, structure begets function. So if our function is changing, our structure must be changing. But we all, we've all been taught that we had this kind of fixed wiring system. So, so just, just on that, that's really interesting because we could backtrack just a little bit in terms of, um, you know, answering Kim's question, how does the neuroplasticity, you know, feed into Feldenkrais? I guess that was my main interest for today to see if you mm-hmm. would be able to um, put together some sort of intersections there. And I, I thought it would be valuable for people to go back to sort of a, a really good understanding for practitioners and for ev- all listeners really on um, some basic ideas of what neuroplasticity is and maybe what are some good keywords that people can hang on to and um, because there's a lot of and some of the words that I, I thought you could help us with are, you know a question of whether we're training the brain are we strengthening brain connections, stimulating new thinking? You know, are we bridging brain gaps? Um, all of this, I know you've got a wealth of expertise as a neuro, neuroscientist in terms of being able to explain to us in, in terms we can, um, I suppose everybody can understand, but also might be useful for Feldenkrais practitioners. Sure. Yep, absolutely. I'll work all that in. Um, So, yeah, so what this idea of neuroplasticity is, is that the brain can change um, as opposed to the hardwired hierarchical thing that I was talking about that some of us were taught. And that Feldenkrais indicated that he understood this even before the science wasn't showing it. And so what I think simplistically what we what we need to understand neuroplasticity is, is it's it's the underpinning of how we learn. It's the physiology. It's the cellular level of learning um, and it happens all the time. And it's it's agnostic about whether it's good or bad or indifferent. It's simply brain changes. Um, and so what we should be then interested in is how to make those processes service well, as opposed to service in, a, um, in, a, in an unhelpful way. So, I mean, habits, ha- habits are based on neuroplasticity whether they're good habits, bad habits, or whatever. And you can think about habits as being, you know, very well-trodden paths, very um, well-rehearsed, well-practiced neural connections. Um, you know, you can you can think of it at the physiological level um, about, you know, the sort of what we call long-term potentiation where synaptic pathways are more, more likely to fire. So at that very cellular level, habits exist and then they manifest all the way through and the continuum to it to be an actual behavior so that's that's what you're sort of talking about that's a process of neuroplasticity that you know there's the use it or lose it stuff you know neurons that fire together wire together that there's a whole lot of physiology behind that and you can look at it at that neuronal level um, and then but you can aggregate that up to the behavioural level. And that's what Feldenkrais is talking about. At the behavioural level is that we create habits and habits in and of themselves aren't good or bad. Habits are really like we want to be able to talk and think while we're walking. So we want walking to be relatively habitual. And by habitual, I mean organised at a pretty, you know, at a lower level of the brain that doesn't require a lot of consciousness. But that comes with a double edge is that we might walk in a habitual way that's not serving us particularly well or not particularly adaptable or whatever it might be. So the whole point then about Feldenkrais is to examine those habits, bubble them up to the surface of consciousness where we can manipulate them in a way, um, but not in a particularly cognitive, interrogative, you know, intellectual way, but at that experiential way of awareness and maybe add, maybe shift the habits, soften the habits, create a couple more habits, you know, a couple more pathways so that we've got a choice about the habits so that we're not locked into one stereotypical, um, seemingly hardwired, I don't norm- enormously like that word, um, way of being. But we can access it if we, if we need to. Um, because, like I said, you don't want to have to think really consciously about walking all the time if you're talking or carrying something or 
you know, um, you know, counting backwards in sevens, like with what we do in clinic, <laughs> get people to walk and count backwards in sevens. Why? Who knows? No, we do not well. So that's so that's really then at the behavioural end of neuro of the neuroplastic phenomenon. So you can see, but what we're talking about there is learning, and learning and plasticity are the same thing. You know, one's just talking at the physiological level, one's talking at the behavioural level, but it's the same thing. So that's why it's so fundamental for us, and why. The research that started coming out in the 80s and the 90s and is merging ever since about just how plastic, i.e. how changeable the brain is, has been such a confirmation for us. And for Fel if Feldenkrais was alive, he'd be going, oh, well, yeah, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, of course, because he knew it from an experiential point of view. And I think that's what's really interesting is when the science catch up, catches up with his the acuteness and the accuracy of his observations. Mm. So it's in that, um, uh, you know, what underpins the science that underpins learning, you know, there is a lot of information. There's a lot of research out there which you can elaborate on. And I'm just wondering, in terms of functional reorganisation, which we think that um, or we hope we're having an effect on, the awareness of the person in the learning that they're doing in an awareness through movement lesson or a functional mm. integration lesson. Um, the, the science related to the physiology there, uh, is, that, is that coming in now, that, that research, to do with um, the way that, uh, the way, you know, we used to think that we had um, just a fixed number of neurons and that was what we got. Would you like to comment on where that is now with the neurophysiology? Yeah, so, I mean, we can talk about this at many different levels. I mean, it's probably not so helpful at the, to talk about it at an individual neuronal or synaptic level, but just the way that those connections can be enhanced or not enhanced, as the case may be. Um, your comment about a fixed number of neurons, uh, I'm still very hesitant about getting excited about neurogenesis in humans. Um, Neurogenesis means generating new neurons, or genesis is birth, um, neurons, neuros, neurons. Yes, there is evidence that we do create new neurons as adults, um, but there's still no real evidence that they become functional. So I'm just saying that it could change tomorrow. You know, we've got to keep our eyes on the literature. Um, you know, there's just a very recent... It's all about the connections, isn't it's it? It's all about the connections. So there's not mm. evidence that they become functional. There, there's a very recent paper that shows that even people with dementia are still creating new neurons in particular areas like the hippocampus, like very deep inside the brain, but not really conclusive evidence that they become functional. Um, so a lot of people are quoting, you know, oh, well, you know, exercise creates neurogenesis. They're, they're mouse studies. So we have to be a bit careful. So I personally don't feel that we are we can be confident about talking about neurogenesis. That's different. Neuroplasticity is about what we've got and making better use of it, making the connections more efficient or um, more varied, more adaptable, and that fits in with the learning paradigm. So um, I think we can be very confident about that simply because it makes sense, but also because of the evidence around, I mean, this thing called functional reorganisation is an we can use that from a Feldenkrais point of view. What it means from a neuroplastic point of view is that instead of talking about the individual cells, we're talking about cells in the neurons and their supporting cells, like the glial cells. So neuroplasticity isn't just about the neurons. It's about the whole thing, about the better support for that. Um, it, it's, it's Functional reorganisation is when there is, there's an aggregated response of neural tissue or neural structures or a neural area to a demand, a functional demand. That's what's called functional reorganization. And it fits in very well with what we think that we do. So the early literature about functional reorganization came from quite diverse studies. I mean, one of the classics was, um, you know, the people who were blind from birth. And um, they, so normally, I tell this story a lot, it's a, it's a classic seminal neuroplastic study. And it came about when we could start, well, researchers could start imaging the brain better. So at the back of our head, so our occipital lobes right here at the back, we were all taught, everybody would be taught from a neuroanatomical point of view, they are related to vision. They, are, they do vision, they do acuity of vision, they do you know, all the different permutations of vision, colour and blah, blah, blah. 
Um, However, in people who were blind, when they were scanning their brains and they were reading Braille with their fingers, so this is a tactile function. If you, if it, uh, we three could read Braille and we had our brain scan doing this, we would be processing this firstly in the primary sensory cortex, which is here, like parietal, this part of our brain. When they, when they scanned the people who were blind from birth, who'd never had sight, they were using their occipital cortex to process the tactile information. So that's an, that's an example of functional reorganisation. So the function of the occipital lobes had reorganised based on a need, um, which was reading Braille. So that was one of the biggest, and that just blew everybody's heads because, you know, I mean, neuroanatomy had just absolutely fixated that these regional areas did this. And for a visual cortex to be involved in a tactile function was extraordinary. Uh, so it kind of lifted the lid on this possibility for the way that brains can, whole chunks of the brain can reorganise. Um, we know it very clearly, like in the motor cortex, these are easy experiments to do, where we can functionally reorganise small groups of neurons, you know, just by simply zapping. You can, you know, we can, I can zap your thumb. Um, you know, with an electrical stimulus, and the, the, that part of your motor cortex will get bigger. And Susan, oh, can we amazing. see that? Susan, oh. sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was going to say, um, Kim, does that does that mean, Susan, that um, we can see that kind of activity on the newer kinds of scans that are around? And then, then um, you know, and I know Kim wants to ask then about how do those scans? How are those useful? in matching up the clinical picture of someone who's had a stroke and the rehabilitation after Yeah. Look, I mean, there's different scans. There's scans and scans and scans now. And, yes, they do pick up those changes. It, the, the interpretation is tricky. I mean, what, what I was saying about the motor cortex, and we can change that. We, that, we don't even need to scan that. That's using transcranial magnetic stimulation. So we can create a motor map, if you like, and show that the territory of the of the primary motor cortex, for example, can change. It doesn't last because it's not. It's not a learning. It's, that's not a learning thing. That's just we've just excited a whole bunch of neurons, and they've got very excited, and they've you know they've swapped allegiance. So maybe you know a group of neurons that were kind of on the borders between, let's say, the region for the thumb and the finger. You know they swap allegiance. So that cortical rivalry we call it, or territorial rivalry, the pain science people call it smudging. You know that. That is very manipulatable at that a sort of small neuronal pool level um, all the way up to this sort of bigger organize, reorganisation stuff. So, yeah, that's all possible. Now, imaging is a bigger question. Um, and, yes, I think there has been an imaging study in Feldenkrais. People can jump on and have a look at that about the changes. Um, I think they were doing some kind of um, – oh, I shouldn't be even quoting it because I'll get it wrong um, – maybe it was like the false floor lesson um, where they were, they showed that the brain responded differently to when they did the false floor lesson with an idea of connecting all the way up through the skeleton. So the, so the intention of the practitioner and then the, for the, to, to evoke an experience in the person was reflected in demonstrably different brain activation. Now, but we've got to be careful though, because, Brains activating in regions doesn't necessarily mean better function. It just means that they're getting bigger blood flow, if that's the particular kind of scan that you're doing. Um, and actually a refined skill might have smaller area than a, you know, so let's not go too de detailed, but probably the, suffice to say that where scanning is going at the moment is more, in, is people are more interested not in the regions that are lighting up, but in the strength of the connections between regions. So this idea of connectomics or studying connectivity, strengths of connections, strengths of pathways, that and, and, and the sort of um, strengths of pathways and the richness of a network, that's probably where scanning is going now. And it's highly technical. And that's a problem for us because <laughs> for us to do our work and have that kind of evidence, uh, costs a lot of money. I'm just going to put that out there now because I know you want to yeah. talk about research in the future, but I'll just throw that in there. So I think I've answered that question. Yeah, no, that's great, Susan. Um, and just for anybody who who isn't, hasn't heard of the, the false floor, because it's something that we've just been learning about in our training, it's a it's actually a lesson uh, that, that Moshe 
Feldenkrais uh, developed for, for people that, that Susan was referring to there, if people want to go and look at that further. But Susan, um, look, it's amazing some of what you're, you're speaking about that or, uh, there. Uh, and I'm, I'm well, we're aware that you're doing a lot of work with people who are recovering from strokes and other other functions where you know, other other where people have lost functions. Can you talk a bit about uh, how you're using the Feldenkrais method to help people regain function, please, after a stroke or or other other issues that people sure. have? Yeah. So um, so for people who are not haven't worked with anybody with stroke, stroke is a an insult to the brain where blood supply is lost either through a blockage or through a bleed. And so parts of the brain die and other parts get seriously pissed off, let's say. Uh, may or may, may not be working. So, um, yeah, and that, that can affect any function depending on what part of the brain has been compromised by that lack of blood flow. And um, so people classically can be affected down one side and they classically can be affected from this, they can't sense. And this is because the part of the brain that senses or deals with the primary sense has been damaged or maybe the perception of that has been damaged. And then also the motor or the movement outputs of the brain might have been affected as well. So the pathways that send messages down to the body from the brain to, to, to act. Thinking can be affected, memory can be affected, personality, like every, anything and everything, can, depending on the, on the area. What we're particularly interested with people with stroke is because they have now this, this sort of maybe a real impairment of sensing and a, and a very real impairment of moving, how can we help that circuitry re-establish? Uh, I think um, there were so many things that Feldenkrais did when he worked with people with stroke or cerebral palsy or those kinds of really neurologically based issues was Firstly, he approached them as a whole person and he recognised that their motivation is to function in the world. It's not about, you know, some kind of esoteric change that he recognised that, you know, what we would now call from a motor control point of view is the task is really important. But the function, the meaning of it is really important. The meaningful action is really key. Um, he recognised that the whole person was involved and he didn't sort of differentiate, you know, carve off, well, I'm only going to deal with the physical and I'll send this emotional and the psychological to somebody else and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can see in his, in his FIs how he related to the whole person and it's just extraordinary, really, when you think about that in the 80s and the way specialisation was starting to kick in. So that's the second thing that I, that I found really unique. The third thing was in within that whole person thing, um, so classically neurological rehab focused really much on, on strengthening and the outputs, you know, practice the, practice the physical movement with very little, if any, um, attention to what does it feel like. Now, from an engineering point of view, that's bollocks. You know, that any system that doesn't have a feedback mechanism degrades. And funnily enough, guess what we see with people with stroke or cerebral palsy? They'll do a movement. If they keep doing it, it can degrade. It gets worse because if you're not getting good feedback for the quality improvement cycle, actually it goes downhill, not uphill. Mm -hmm. So so that was just a revolution for, for me. And, um, you know, it's not, Feldenkrais isn't the only thing that's now looking at sensory training in stroke for example that you know that I've got some fantastic colleagues particularly in Melbourne we've got a bit of an international network who are trying to help therapists see that this is one half perhaps of the picture of rehab because Feldenkrais has been doing it for decades um you know closing that loop um you know what used to be called the sensory motor loop now we call it the perception cognition action loop he routinely closed that loop for people um, in the way that he worked and the, in the way that we've now, you know, had the good fortune to learn to work. So that's what I've been interested in doing from a research point of view um, and from a clinical point of view. I guess the, uh, and where Feldenkrais really helped for people to understand how important that loop was, I, I still remember watching a video of him working on somebody's unaffected side and stroke. Now that was like seriously weird because um, the unaffected side is unaffected. Well, now actually we know it's not unaffected, but he didn't know that from a scientific point of view, but he knew it from an experiential point of view. 
And he, his thinking was really so simple but so elegant about, well, if we want to learn people to learn how to move better, they have to learn how to sense themselves better so they get better feedback. So why would we practice that on a side, you know, which is so diminished and so um, impaired, so faulty, if you like? Let's practice sensing on the side that is less affected. So in stroke, you know, that, that works really well. Um, and that was pretty, that blew my head off, you know, when I first sort of saw that in our training. Um, and then you think about it, it's so logical, isn't it? Why, yeah. why, why do we think anything else? Which is, I yeah. think, one of the, is both one of the great things and one of the frustrating things about Fernal Cross because it's such common sense when you think about it. Um, yeah. There, there we are. We, we, we didn't, you know, us sort of folkies on our own, didn't we? You know, we, we, we needed this guy to bring it all together for us. Anyway, um, yeah. So that's the genius of it. I think is that the common, the common senseness of it, and the, and the, the logical of it, borne out by experience, but now matched by the science is just such a compelling thing. So therefore, with stroke, that's what I'm interested in. Getting back to your question about stroke, is how can we then help people to get a better feedback mechanism, so that they can make better movement decisions? And I'm not necessarily saying consciously. But if we think about motor control as being this sort of solution finding, problem solving, dynamic systems approach, how can we help people to get better information so they make better movement choices so that then they can go into this quality improvement cycle that goes up? So um, we've been interrogating this in different ways, um, starting probably more specifically with people who don't have stroke, just to understand and give evidence that if you do simply train sensory appreciation, particularly from a proprioceptive or movement sense point of view, that improves function. And we've shown that just with normal healthy students from a dexterity point of view. Um, we've looked at Feldenkrais then in people who maybe have balance difficulties. So they don't have any primary sensory or motor impairments that maybe they're aging so that was another study that we did that showed that yes if you add that sensory awareness element to a movement class so we had one group do a movement class and one group do a movement class that was Feldenkrais which arguably is movement with the value add of the sensory awareness or the perception stuff and of course and they did better their balance got better because we closed that loop um, and then most recently another PhD student um, Inez Serrata looked at um, a group of people with stroke and we divided them into um, they did an awareness for movement series and it's a very, very simple series um, the elderly citizen series so all of you can access that um, 10, 10 ATMs they did it each one twice a week and a big shout out to two practitioners here in Adelaide Margaret Mayo and Jane Searle who volunteered their time can I just say volunteered their time to do these classes for 10 weeks and we compared that group of people with stroke who came to the class twice a week and the other group we gave them taped lessons of the same same lesson but at home um, because we wanted some kind of meaningful control so and, and in a way what we showed with that was that actually face-to-face -face lessons are really good I'm not saying Tilly tele lessons aren't good but this was without having somebody in the room both groups improved but obviously the face-to-face -face class improved a lot more and they improved in a in a functional and demonstrable way so we looked at um, outcome measures but we also asked them how they felt and their their responses were as you would anticipate that they felt better about their bodies they felt more aware of their bodies it was challenging to become more aware of the side of their body that they had lost awareness because of the stroke. But then it became positive because of the way the classes are structured in terms of seeking positive, seeking feeling better, not rubbing your nose in what you can't do, but finding out really appreciating what you can do. That awareness experience was turned from a, oh God, this is so depressing. I, you know, I knew I was stuffed, but I didn't know I was that stuffed, to, oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know that I didn't know that. Now I know that I don't know that and I've got something to do about it, that kind of response. So that is just so um, The results inspiring. were 
the results were in were exciting, weren't they, Susan? Yeah. And that that's a published study. Yeah, that's just been published. Now people will, will criticize us because we don't have Feldenkrais in the title. What we have to recognize as a community is that science isn't interested in dead men and their names and that sort of stuff. Science is interested in ideas and what that actually means. Sorry about the dead men. Um <laughs> So we had to call it, right. we called it body awareness training so that people understood what we're talking about. Now, within the text, of course, we, we say we call it Feldenkrais. But in order to get this, you know, get science as such engaged, or, you know, whatever science is, engaged in this process of inquiry, we have to show that we're not marketing something. We're actually doing a scientific inquiry. And therefore, what we're looking at is training body awareness not Feldenkrais, if that makes sense. So I know I know we'll, we'll cop a bit of mm. flack about that, but people just have to understand the game that we play here. Um, well, I'm not sure that you, um, I don't think you should cop flack for that because, I mean, the neuroscience is backing up what Moshe Feldenkrais's theory was from all that time ago. So I'm, I'm not so sure that there will be flack because I think that intersection I spoke about with, between neuroscience and Feldenkrais, you'll seem to be right on the cutting edge of that, Susan. And um, thank you to all your co-researchers and the practitioners who've been involved in the research mm -hmm. because, um, I mean, you, you did a, uh, your review article, your literature review from 2015, which has been... Um, so oft quoted in, in the research and was very comprehensive on the effectiveness of the Feldenkrais method, a systematic review of the evidence. Mm. You know, that's one place that people can go to to get a starting point to get uh, a handle and a resource for where the research is and what they can read. And yep. um, in terms of participation from Feldenkrais practitioners, you know, there are we are all interested in advancing the method and seeing where those intersections are. So, you know, what other ways at this point do you think we need to contribute as practitioners? Um, what's, what's the invitation that's needed there for practitioners and specific directions from studies and, you know, the, towards the future direction of what will be needed? Yeah, look, it's, it, it, you know, this, this is a big question and there's an international group looking at research. Um, I think, you know, we Cliff Smythe and I did a podcast a couple of months ago about where the research is at um, and the, particularly around methods for inquiry into the into the Feldenkrais method itself. I, I, it kind of depends where we want it to go. Um, so Cliff himself and others have done fantastic, more qualitative research into the experience of Feldenkrais, and that's extremely validating at that experiential level. You know, what? I, let's just call it the Tirana level, Kim. <laughs> you, know, the, you know, what's okay. my experience? You know, what as a participant, what's my experience and really validating that? The research that, that I do is, you know, is, more, is very pragmatic. It's about an evidence base, and it will have its critics like like everything does it's not perfect however I think what we can do as a Feldenkrais community is actually apply our our ability to speak to different audiences and to frame the Feldenkrais work in different ways to suit the different audiences so if I'm working with a health audience or an or an audience that wants an evidence base then I need to talk in the language of randomized controlled trials if I'm talking to sociologists or whoever it, or you know you know, maybe creative artist or something. I need to talk in an, in a way that's experiential and personal, and that will require a different set of methods. So we we need to have in our research um, repertoire that broad range of um, evidentiary kind of treaties, if you like. Um, and you know, we're all committed to to doing that. Funding is a huge issue because no government funding, which is where most you know, trials are funded, is going to fund something particularly around, you know, for us around quality of life. You know, they'll fund, um, you know, drug trials and anti-smoking trials and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, I must admit, I was so naive when I first started in academia, I did put in Feldenkrais Christ grants and got absolutely hammered. <laughs> but, <laughs> so now we, we kind of sneak it in and we do these little sort of ninja um, studies um 
it would be great to find the funding to do some bigger definitive studies. People have, you know, you can see in the systematic review some great work in Scandinavia around neck pain and those sorts of things. So I think if people can feel enthused, look at the different kinds of studies. The IFF website has them all. Read them and see what you're interested in and then get in touch with any of us. Um, yeah, yeah, just Susan, that... Yeah. IFF, that just for people that, for Feldenkrais practitioners know that as the International Feldenkrais Federation and um, we can access that on online. And uh, also, I mean, that's a, that's a website we might put as a link because it does have a lot of useful information for the general yeah. public too. So um, that's a good one. And it's a good, great starting point because the, a lot of the research is linked onto that. And I wonder if uh, afterwards when we uh, we might pop some links attached to this podcast mm -hmm. and we might be able to link into that one you spoke about where you were talking about the cutting edge science with Cliff, um, Cliff Smythe. So I think yep. that would be really useful. And, uh, and I know that... Um, uh, I know that Kim had some other questions because it's just the word train and training has sort of come up throughout this podcast. You know, you... You began as a Feldenkrais practitioner, you trained as a Feldenkrais practitioner, and then you became a trainer. And um, I suppose the, my interest in the neuroplasticity you've described for us in terms of training and training the nervous system. And so thank you for putting some new light on that because I think you've given people some, some things to think about. But uh, in terms of training, it's all about the learning, isn't it? What do you think, Kim? Uh, well, Susan, I'm quite interested in just your journey as a, as a Feldenkrais trainer because you've been a trainer for quite some time now. You're a, also an educational director. Um, I, as, a, as a trainee, I, I hear your passion because uh, I sit and listen to you for, for quite a long time and, and really enjoy, you know, what you, what you speak about. Um, what do you love about being a Feldenkrais trainer? Oh, look, it's a, it's a great privilege. Um, you know, I, I often will end, a bit of a spoiler alert for you guys coming up to the end of your training, but um, it's like, I don't know, it's like feeling like, you feel like your father Christmas in a way, because, we, you know, it's such a great gift to give people um, to, to um, help them on this path and then and then see people blossom in their own journey like I was saying with my individual clients that's what it's like working in a training program um, in, but in some ways it's 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 almost easier because you guys have self-selected and, you, and your motivations there. it doesn't mean to say that you don't you know give us a hard time and question things which is what you should be doing um, you know it's, it's not like you're just a one big gullible audience you know you're very um, informed and self-reflective and bring bring an interest that is um, really you know a great privilege to be um, amongst I I think what what is probably the most um, rewarding from our point of view having now watched the way training programs have evolved over the years um, is that like firstly to say that the method works I don't think anyone would say that the way that, that that our training was run, you know, in Melbourne or the early, the first Sydney one and the first Melbourne one, they were big numbers. You know, we had 120 people. Um, it was it was just it was after Feldenkrais had died. There was mayhem in the community, um, you know, and the, and the people who trained us did us the best that they could, given that some of them had only been working as practitioners for a couple of years we realized afterwards so there was a yes. lot of things about that you know and particularly in Australia so everybody was imported so we all thought that you could only learn Feldenkrais if somebody had an accent you know we we didn't hear an Australian voice in the room um, all those sorts of things now we've watched over the years changing and now we've got this rich international community you know through the training and accreditation bodies that we, with this reciprocal kind of recognition of the way folk can be trained and watching that evolve and watching training programs evolve and keep up with the times, you know, incorporating new ways of delivering material, you know, you know online, um, watching new pedagogies come in um, so that, you know, we can learn from other ways of, of teaching and learning. 
Um, you know, the Felton Christ, you know, we've all seen Amherst. He sat there and he talked at people and it worked. You know, great people came out of that training. But are there better ways of doing that? Are there more, you know, because it's different times, there's different methods. So I think that's what is really exciting about how do we incorporate new ways of doing things and still keep the method, keep true to the method um, is, has been a is really fascinating journey um, because, you know, I remember someone saying to me once, well, why don't you just, why don't we just all just do Amherst, you know, just sit and do the Amherst videos. I think you only have to watch, you know, a couple of days worth to realise that's why we don't. Because, um, I mean, yeah, they're a great resource, but it's contextual, isn't it? When you think about now how we do training programs, particularly in light of the fact that people can't take nine weeks off a year and just go and, you know, go to a gym in Amherst and roll around on the floor and be berated and, you know, whatever. You know, we do need to be flexible. We need to meet people where they're at, you know. Um, well, you're incorporating really, the, the science of teaching and learning, aren't you, yeah, in there? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, there was... When one one person devises a method, of course, there's a tendency for that to be, you know, you know, I mean, worship forward, you know, a bit guru. How do we not let that happen to to the method? You know, how do we keep it real? How do we keep it accessible and ensure that it doesn't become, you know, a power dominated hierarchical learning model? which is what things, you know, it's easy to go into that. How do we not let, let, hap, let that happen? How do we as, as teaching staff keep grounded and keep ensuring that the, those relationships stay where you guys are empowered to learn for yourself as opposed to us teaching you? You know, that's, yeah. that's the trick because it's easy to teach. Like I can just stand it like I am doing now and wave my hands around and give you all the theory and you're very impressed and you go, oh, aren't you a very smart girl, blah, blah, blah. But that's actually not the method. The method is you guys, you know, on the floor figuring out for yourself yeah. and then coming saying, can you just give us the answer? And we go, nah, or not nah, but we go, oh, well, it depends. And you go, oh, that's really frustrating. Give me the answer. And we go, well, let's let's go back into this process of inquiry and, and we're not you know we're not doing this to diminish the the, the pertinence of the, of the question it's more let's go back into the process of inquiry and then you get to figure it out for yourself and then you walk away feeling good not me walking away feeling good because I'm such a fantastic teacher but you walk away going my lordy I am such a fantastic learner because then that sets you up for life that's what I love about being a trainer yeah, that's fantastic. And, I, you know, I remember the day I think I asked you and about the, the end of the first year or beginning of the second year, can you just tell us, you must know what I needed to do to be able to do that movement. Well, no, I don't. And, uh, and that was that exact frustration, I think. And, and now being in my final year, I, I, I get it. I totally get that. But, you know, it must be fantastic for you to, to watch us, you know, watch the students arrive, your little, your little chicks come in. And really what happens is that we undergo exactly the journey that you're talking about, the neuroplasticity unfolds. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the things that we thought were our nature, where our brain was fixed, we go, oh, yeah. actually, gosh, look at how I was back in first year and look at what I'm capable of now. So, um, yeah. And, and then, of course, being able to then become teachers of that method, you know, it's it's just an amazing journey and, and one that I'm certainly feeling, and I know Libby is very blessed to have had. Um, anyway, I'll uh, hand back to Libby for, for our wrap-up, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Look, it's um, that's a, a wonderful description, I think, Susan, of the development of agency. That, and self-agency and autonomy mm. that happens throughout the Feldenkrais learning process. And so we can apply that. And I think it parallels the neuroscience too and where mm. you've, um, you've taken us to with that. And so that can take place in, in both um, the journey of a practitioner or learning to be a practitioner, but the journey also of the, an individual taking an awareness through movement class, mm -hmm. um, having an individual lesson, which is the fun FI, the functional integration mm -hmm. lesson. So all of those. And, of course, um, thank you, Kim, for 
getting a little bit more from Susan about what it's like to actually be a trainer and the learning journey of a trainer, being a learning journey of a trainer. So um, for me, it kind of all wraps together. And I love the idea that um, you've taken us on a personal journey today of your lead into Feldenkrais and the Feldenkrais method and in sharing your knowledge and expertise and experience and, and your um, wealth of sort of published uh, studies too, which is so uh, well, it's world renowned. It, it is world renowned. It's published many different places in books and and um, journals and scientific journals <laughs> too. And I just think that you've um, you've made us curious too in, ter in terms of exploring Feldenkrais further and hopefully uh, I think you've extended our learning curve and maybe you've bent our learning curve too, which is a good thing to leave us curious to uh, have a look at some of the research, um, explore some of the research directions, keep in touch with the uh, with that and actively do that, encourage practitioners to do that. And I love the idea of, of looking at um, closing that perception, cognition, action loop um, in stroke rehabilitation, but not just stroke rehabilitation, it's applicable to movement disorders and the scope of which we didn't really talk about here, but other people have, and how just how much validity there is in empowering people in personal experience to, to um, have a look at Feldenkrais. So we will put some, um, put some links on the, this podcast uh, access. And thank you for this wonderful experience of, um, of um, sharing with you on behalf of Kim and myself and all the listeners. We are really grateful for all the work that you're doing and in how you present it um, so simply and elegantly. So thanks, Susan, very much. And pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Uh, and if I can just conclude by acknowledging that that I've been talking to you from the land of the Ghana people here in South Australia, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and uh, acknowledge the, with gratitude that we have this opportunity. Thank you, and I can see Kim up there on Gubby Gubby. Cubby, Cubby lands, and I'm on Wurundjeri uh, country. So thank you, Susan, very much for that and in appreciation. Thank you. Thanks.